If you uh, filled out a prayer slip for Margaret, would you pass it to the aisle? And the ushers are coming down. They've got some Bibles to loan if you don't have one. Thank you for filling those out. And then if you want to take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. I know sometimes we spend the whole month of December on Christmas messages, but you know, I was looking at this, I said, this is, this is a Christmas message too. Yes. All right, thank you, ushers. Let's have prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and as we spend some moments in it, we ask you to be our teacher. Lord, help us to put aside things of this life and to focus on this wonderful passage of Scripture. And I pray your Holy Spirit will be free to make us more like Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we talked about the Holy Spirit last week, how He helps us. And... Uh, that's a wonderful thing. God indwelling you, sharing that body with you. Now, uh, verse um, 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a victory there. This shows the purpose and the plan of God um, from start to finish. Just a summary of what God's done start to finish in order to save you. And it, re it centers around the work of His Son, doesn't it? But, uh, you know, in life we, we get, uh, sometimes we get a little lost thinking that we're uh, adrift, that somehow we are uh, more responsible than we are able to be uh, for things that happen to us. And, uh, you know, this is a sin-cursed world. And whether it's your fault or somebody else's fault, there's suffering that goes on, we've seen. And, uh, but this is a chapter that builds to a crescendo that says we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Now, if you know anything about history in this culture that it was written, the conqueror was the top dog. I mean, the Romans had the empire and they were about conquering. They were about... Uh, plunder and taking possession and slavery and they were they they would celebrate their conquering with parades and showing off their strength and their power and so in that world that that seemed to be the top dog in this world but God says the lowliest Christian is more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ and so when you were dealing with the various problems that come in your life that just kind of, some of them pop up, some of them ease in on us and uh, we can see them coming. Some of them just blindside us. But this is the victory, this ours. This is the promise of God. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then God says this. He says all things, all things, Work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now, we got the witness and the blessing and the intercession of the Holy Spirit and the Son of God and the, Holy, and the Father for us. Uh, hold your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And then keep going to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. How's that for recovery? Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter four. Second, yes. And then it says in verse sixteen, therefore we do not lose heart. Now now Paul is 
speaking personal testimony here, but he has not used the singular. He's used the plural pronoun, including all who are going through it with him. We do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Because <laughs> it's God who is at work in you. It's not because you're amazing, though you might be. You know, a legend in your own mind. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, t- yeah. Uh, verse 17. Paul, what are you talking about here? Our light affliction. Don't you understand what I'm going through? Of course he did. Paul understood what you were going through. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We just read that when we were talking about suffering. This man knew about suffering. He knew it very well. He was intimately involved with suffering. Okay? And this is a man who, if I were he, I can imagine that I'd thrown in the towel a long time ago. But this man is still standing in the grace of God in the victory that's his in Christ. And he says, our light affliction is but for a moment. And look, this, this, look what he says. This is because we know that all things work together for good. And so how does that manifest itself here? He says, our light affliction, it's only a little while, it's working for us. Now this, this must make the devil crazy. You know? Can you think about that? He says, I'm going to get this one. And he throws his fiery dart. He brings on his greatest test and trial and temptation he can upon you. And then the Word of God says, God's going to use that for your good. That's going to work for you. Not against you. Somebody said, you know, when, when Satan wakes you up at night and he's bothering you, you just go to prayer. And when you go to prayer, he'll get frustrated because you're, you're doing something he didn't want you to do and he'll leave you alone. Well, I don't know if he'll leave you alone or not, but um, here it says that his attacks, because of the grace of God, they work for us. God works in it for us. It was working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So, you know, light, affliction, heavy glory. That's what we saw in Romans 8 there. It's working for us. And so, the Holy Spirit is working for us. The events that happen in your life are working for us. And then we come to this wonderful last scripture there God is for us I don't know if you're walking in that victory or not but that's where your mind needs to be because that's the reality it's not that the reality is the, are the forces of darkness that have come upon us or the trials and the tribulations or the health that I'm struggling with all of those things are light affliction and they're but for a moment I, I don't mean that they don't matter. I don't mean that they don't hurt. I don't mean that, that they're not a struggle. I'm telling you that He is the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's the victory we have here. Look what God has done. He has covered the whole base, all the bases for us. God didn't forget something. It is start to finish that you are safe in Jesus and that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And He has a goal for your life that when He's done, you won't even believe it. You won't even recognize yourself when He's finished with you. I can hardly wait. And this body we already saw, we're groaning. We're... We should be, when we get a little glimpse of this, we're earnestly desiring to be clothed with our body from His heaven. You know, we said, you look like a child of Adam, a son of Adam now, but you're going to look like a son of God. What does that look like? (laughs) Well, it's amazing. It's amazing what God has for us. Back in Romans 8, it says that He is working in all these things for our good. 
He didn't take them away. He, he didn't let us avoid all of the troubles and trials. He said, I can use these. We, we might, if we, had the, if we had the list, we'd say, Lord, take this off, this off, this off. And he says, well, you're going to, if I take that off, you're going to miss out on something really amazing. God says, I know what I'm doing. So, the called according to His purpose. You know, this is where the victory in Paul's life really came about. When Paul said, <clears throat> I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead. Paul is dead. Christ is alive in me. And when he left his purpose and embraced Christ's purpose for him, that changed everything. He looks at everything in this scripture differently, doesn't he, than the natural man. He looks at it completely different. Things that would say, I quit, I give up, go, you know. We got people in the, in the Bible that says, Lord, you tricked me. You know, Jeremiah says, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about this anymore. It just brings heartache and trouble. Paul says, I'm pressing. I'm moving forward in Christ. And uh, not that Jeremiah isn't a great guy, but this is what we should follow. What has God done for us? You know, we, we live in time. And uh, I don't know any other way to do this except, you know, I was conceived and I was born and I, you know, birthdays, growing up, doing this. It's, we, we live in time and it moves in one direction, doesn't it? That's the only way I know to live. And, and it's the way we've, this is the world we live in. I mean, there's times I wish I could back up. You ever, you ever been in that situation and say, Lord, can I just back up a little bit and, and say that over? <laughs> or, uh, or uh, you know, I, I think I could make a better decision now if I could just go back. And, we can't. You cannot go backwards. But you see, God dwells outside of time. He, he, he can operate in ways we can't. You know, that's why, you know, his prayer, you say, oh, well, what we're praying for, well, it's, it's too late. Well, if you don't know what God's doing or done, I don't think it's too late because God's not bound the same way we are. We can talk to him about these things. God dwells outside of time. He's not limited in that way. And so it says this is what God has done. It says he's done this for us. And yet, many of these, some of this is in our future. In fact, when this was written, all of it was in our future. We were in the future. And so look what it says God has done. He, you know, Philippians 1, he, the one who began the good work will finish it. And so that's what this is telling us here. Whom he foreknew. This is in... Uh, this word means to know before. Now who knows the future? God, we talked about that last week with the kids, remember? For, who knows the future? And, the, and God told Israel all about Jesus Christ coming. God knows. And He says, I've told you things before they happen so you'd know who I am and what I have control over. But we need to understand that this is not about God's control. This is not an action by God. This is a characteristic of God, an attribute. He knows before. That's what it means to know before. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. You know, you ever say that? Man, I didn't see that coming. God never says that. Never. Has He ever said that? Never will He say that. He foreknew. Those He foreknew. God sees t yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God knew you. There was a song... When I was a new Christian, I used to love that. And, it, and it, it talked about being in the mind of Christ when he hung upon the cross. That's 2,000 years ago. But the idea is that he was dying for me. God knows ahead of time. Now, this isn't, mean, this isn't an action of God. Some people say it is. But it, that's not what the word is about. I know that the sun will rise tomorrow. How many agree with me? Who's not sure? <laughs> you wouldn't admit that, huh? All right. If you read the Bible, you know that it's going to rise tomorrow. Okay. 
Now, if you know, I know the sun will rise tomorrow. I am absolutely sure. If I were a gambling man, I'd bet everything I own on that. I would, but I'm not a gambling man. But I know the sun will rise tomorrow. So that means I'm responsible for that. Because I know it. For new is about knowing. God knows everything. He is omniscient. And to say that he knows it because he made it happen makes God responsible for evil. And that's not possible because the Lord is good. So those he foreknew, understand that. God knew ahead of time. And he knew you ahead of time. And so God predetermined. This is an action of God. He predestined. He predestined. Now this, this, this passage here is very clear. You don't have to read somebody else's theology into it. Just let the scripture speak for what it says. What did God, who foreknew you ahead of time, He knew about you before... What did He predetermine about you? Knowing that you would hear and believe the gospel, God predetermined something very special about you. This is what He predetermined. He predetermined... That you would be conformed to the image of His Son. So you, He said, that, that one, that one, that one, they're going to respond to the good news. And I have determined, I have before ordained that this will happen. That believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will be made just like Him, conformed to His image. So that's the work He started. And God will finish it. Now I'm not sure what all that means. To be conformed to the image of His Son. It's pretty amazing though to think about, isn't it? It's like, what is the goal? What, what you know, when, when an artist is creating something, they have a, a goal in mind. There's something that they're working to, to produce. You know when God looks at you and He says, let's see, how is this going to work? He looks at His Son and said, that's what I want this one to look like. That's what I want Him to be like. That's what God is doing in your life. And sometimes it takes some pain, some sorrow, some disappointment. Sometimes those things are used. God always uses whatever is in our life. And the goal, and this is the victory... What is the goal? What is the purpose? Don't we want that? Isn't that the worst thing about tragedy? When you can't see any reason for it? And much of life is like that, isn't it? You scratch your head and you say, Lord, I just can't see any reason for something this horrible. Well, in your life as a Christian, let's narrow it down, God says, I've got a... I've got something I can do with that in your life. I am going to use that to make you like my son. Is that okay? Would you, would you like that for God to make you like Jesus? Would, would it be worth it to suffer a little bit or to have a few pains and disappointment if, if going through the other side you were like Jesus? Would that be worth it? It sure would, wouldn't it? This is why we have, to, we have to see things from God's perspective. We have to look at the goal. We have to look at the finish line. That's what Paul was doing. That's what God wants you to do. Don't focus on now in that sense without looking at what is going to come from it. It doesn't make any sense. And, and I don't think we should hold God responsible at all for these things. It's a part of living this crazy world we live in, isn't it? Some of it's our own stupid decisions. But isn't this... This is the more than conqueror. Oh, God, I made a stupid decision. God says, yes, you did. I tell you what, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it for your good. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That He might be... The firstborn among many brethren. You know, and in, in, uh, this sermon's too long for the time we have. The, uh, in Hebrews, we, we saw that 
when, when they, it's talking about Jesus coming to the earth and uh, being made like unto his brethren, it says that in, in uh, Hebrews 2.11, for both he who sanctifies and those being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now listen. I don't know if you've got any relatives that you are uh, ashamed of. You don't have to raise your hand. I don't, we don't want to hear about that now. But, uh, or if you have any relatives that are ashamed of you. I don't know. But the, uh, the idea here is that Jesus is not ashamed to call those whom He has redeemed His brethren. You know why? Because we are holy in the sight of God. We, we stand before God someday. You know, it's like Jesus is, he just put His arm around all of us and say, Father, here they are. Here they are, Lord. And He's not ashamed to call His brethren because we have been given the righteousness of Christ. Our sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. He's not ashamed of us. We shouldn't be ashamed of one another, should we? Maybe we're ashamed of some of the stupid things we do, but we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and what a glorious thing. Verse 29. Y'all need to hurry faster. Whom he foreknew, all right, he also predestined. And uh, verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, now, that doesn't mean God says, you're going to be saved, and you're going to be saved. That's not what it's about. It's about those who trust Christ. We are going to be conformed to the image of the Son. You understand predestination? Thank you. All right. And then it says, those that He predestined, this is beforehand. Beforehand was foreknowledge. Beforehand was predestination, predetermined. And then we're on the earth and we meet God's plan. He calls us. How does He do that? First Thessalonians says He... Anyway, He, <laughs> he calls us by the Gospel. He calls us by the Gospel. Senior moment there. I said, I don't want to... This is being taped. I better not say the wrong verse. <laughs> He calls us by the gospel. You heard that Christ died for your sins and that He rose again. And you believe that. And you put your trust in Christ. That was God's call. Now, you're, you're, you're not who you were anymore. You are a child of God. So He says, make your calling and election sure. You've been given a title and a position. You've been called into the family of God. And now you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And so He called you. When He called you and you heard and you believed, you were justified. He declared you righteous. And uh, those He justified, He also glorified. Lord, that's past tense. I'm reading my Bible. We just looked at some scriptures. Glorification of the members of the body of Christ is in the future. By our reckoning, isn't it? All right, it hadn't happened. Remember, you look like a child of Adam, not a child of God. Hopefully you act like a child of God, but you look like a son of Adam. We're going to look like a son of God. That's your glorification. You're going to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's your glorification. Oh, that will be glory for me. It will be glory for you. I haven't experienced that yet. But look... The term God uses is in the plan and the purpose of God, there is nothing that will thwart what God has begun in you from being accomplished. And we're going to see some more of that in this wonderful chapter. God is against you or for you? The trouble in your life against you or for you? <laughs> That's a little harder, isn't it? But... It, God says it's for you. He's using it for you. Alright? So we're not losers. Don't be a loser. We're more than conquerors. Father, thank you for giving...